back with the Kara Project. I'm Heather. I'm Sarah. And we've been unpacking different verses throughout the New Testament um, using the Kara Bible Study Guide. This is the guide that we have. You can download it on our website for free. Um, we use this as a way to ask specific questions uh, to help read a Bible on its own terms. Mm -hmm. We also have study guides on our website for every single one of these podcasts. You can go and, um, and access different questions that we go through um, in our podcast so that you can do this as your own Bible study. You could do this with as your, by yourself with a group. It's a great chance to engage uh, with uh, the podcast the way that you'd want. But let's dive into what New Testament passage we have today. We're, mm -hmm. we're in Romans. We're going to be studying Romans 8, 28, Sarah. And the, this is what the verse says. I, this may sound familiar for some of you. It says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. I feel like I've heard this verse often talked about when somebody's going through a hard time. You'll hear this verse mm -hmm. um, kind of quoted or, or talked about, Sarah. So I, I'm very excited for us to unwrap what is the Bible talking about when we see this verse? Right. And it's a lovely verse. It really right? is. It, it really, really is. Yeah, it is. Um, so the, where I would start with, with this verse is a place that we often start, really. It's one of our research questions, yeah. and it's, it's a read and reflect. And when you do that, what observations or questions do you have that come to mind? when you read this passage more than once, you know, this is a practice that actually gets a little bit easier over time. Yeah. You start to be able to kind of ask more questions or make more observations. So don't be discouraged if you can't come up with too many right away. We'll um, help you. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, in fact, my, my questions that I came up, came up with kind of morphed over time. So I, I have three that mm -hmm. we're going to tackle today. The first one, who does this apply to? You know, is this a promise for, for anyone? Uh, the second question, what are all things and is everything supposed to be good? Oh, because all things that work together for good. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And the last one and, and probably the biggest one with this verse is what is good? Oh, if all things are working together yeah. for good, how would you define good? And, and who gets, yeah, exactly. Who gets to define it? And okay. um, hopefully it's me. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, anyway. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe not for everyone else. Um, all right. So the, the first question here, so who does this apply to? Mm -hmm. And we really do see this answer in the verse itself. Um, so uh, when it says that those who love God, love God and who are called according to his purpose. And so there may be a lot of people who say, yeah, I love God. You know, or yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I go to church or whatever, but, but do you live according to his purpose? So there's mm. this connection here between loving God and submitting to his will and yeah. seeking his will. Um, but although we could perhaps stop there and answer that question and just be done here, I, let's, let's go ahead and look at a little bit more context um, surrounding this verse and see what else we can learn who this promise is for. Okay. So if we were to go back um, to the very beginning of chapter 8 and the very first verse, in the NIV translation it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And in the New Living Translation, it says, for those who belong to Christ Jesus. So the, the New Living Translation gives a little bit more clarity, perhaps, to you know what it means to be in Christ. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm going to be using the New Living Translation quite a bit today, um, just because I really like it. And I think it's really, the language that is used in the NLT is really understandable, which yeah. can be really helpful. It grabs the thought for thought around the original yeah. text of the Greek or Hebrew that yeah. it's, it's, it's um, comparing to. So um, it's still keeping in the nature of what the scripture was saying, but it gives it in easier words. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Cool, I like, I like that. that. Yeah. So uh, the, the first 11 verses, I'm just going to kind of summarize what we see there. And it's really this comparison between this life lived according to the spirit versus this life lived according to the flesh. And one of the first takeaways is those in Christ Jesus no longer live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And again, the, the New Living Translation is helpful here. It translates flesh as sinful nature, uh, which is a little bit maybe more descriptive. So it's referring to, hum, you know, humans susceptibility to, to sin and living really this self-focused life mm -hmm. instead of a God-centered uh, uh, life. Mm -hmm. Um, we learn in verse seven that the flesh is hostile to God, which points back to our podcast in uh, Romans five ten. Oh, where we talked about enemies of yeah. God being enemies of God. Yeah, yeah. So we're seeing that theme here again. Um, also, we see in verse six that that the flesh leads to death, but the spirit leads to life and peace. And um, in verse nine, if anyone does not have the spirit, he does not belong to Christ. Hmm. So we're going to pick up here, and I'm going to read verses fourteen through sixteen. For a little bit more clarity here. 
It says, for all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit joins us with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. I love that you brought up this Abba Father thing because I've been, I recently read this book but called Misreading Scriptures with Individualistic Eyes. It's written by E. Randolph Richards and Richard James. Both are really good at taking in the idea of what did, what did the Eastern world, the world where the Bible was written, how did they view it and how does that change the way that we read the Bible? And I have to say shout out for history here because Paul's writing to both Jews and Gentiles. And so when we think of the, 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 the idea of God being our father, we automatically would think like, oh, his like literal father. And that's not what, that's not how they talked. This would have been very common language in the Eastern world for them to use their identity. Um, they connected their identity to their family, to their community. It was very collectivist in the mm -hmm. way that they approached it. It was not individual. It was we, it was us. And so if, if you're seeing this, idea of God adopting us into his family. It's not the literal, uh, you know, family. It's this idea that he's meant to find a new identity or a new community under God. And so when Paul ends up talking to these Jewish people and, and, and the Gentiles, which Gentile just means a non-Jew, so all, all his people in, in the, the Church of Rome, um, we see that he's trying to get them to think as one family and to be uh, identifying as one. And I just love that he's mm -hmm. putting this this patriarchal um, piece of father over top of that to give a very good word picture of who they're supposed to be identifying as. Yeah, that, that is really helpful. And this idea that whether you're Jew or, or Gentile or, who, you know, we're all part of God's family through, through faith. Mm -hmm. So it really becomes this faith family, which actually, you know, growing up in the church, I, it's not uncommon to hear someone say, you know, brother so-and-so or refer yes. to them as a sister in Christ. and. Um, so it is, it's, it's very similar there as, as we become this family. But even in the Eastern culture and mindset, I mean, they would have understood it uh, so much more. But I like how you called it a faith family. We're, we're, we're mm -hmm. a family because of our faith in Christ. Right. I love that. Yeah. So already, just with uh, you know a little bit of context here, I think we can answer that first question of, of who are we talking um, or who does this apply to, mm -hmm. right? Who does this promise apply to? Um, those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. That was just from the verse itself. Yep. But then we also just uncovered it's, it's those who belong to Christ and have his spirit living in them. And when you have God's spirit living in them, you are part of God's family. Well, and this is, this is good because this actually helps us um, maybe take some caution on using this verse with people that don't follow God, because right. if if this really is for that audience, for us that do believe in God and have shown that we love him and, and are wanting to follow his purpose, then I'm not going to probably use it and, and say this verse to somebody that doesn't believe in God, because it's probably out of context. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Um, and yeah, looking at context is extremely important. Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to actually continue in context to um, help us answer our second question, like in what are all things? Oh, yay. yeah. Is everything, should we expect everything to be good if we are a member of God's family? Well, and if I, if I think about it, I, my natural, like if I, I go to apply, one of our questions in apply is about our assumptions and biases we bring in. Yeah. My natural reaction, if I read a verse like this is, okay, um, all things is going to mean everything, including my material possessions, my health, my life. When I think of all things, that's the assumption I'm bringing into this passage. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the things here on earth. Right. And, and that actually is an assumption that I've heard quite a bit mm -hmm. regarding this verse is, yeah, that man, if I love God, my life should turn out good yeah. in, in all of those ways. That's right. That, that's, yeah. I think a little bit of how we use this verse or have, you know, easily use this verse and I'm getting the sense that that's not necessarily what this verse is saying. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to, we're going to read some context here, folks. It's going to be really important. And, and so I, we just read, um, verses 14 through 16, mm -hmm. talking about being a part of God's family. And I'm going to continue reading um, verses 17 and 18. Now, in my Bible, in a lot of the Bibles I looked at, there was a section break between verse 17 and verse 18. Yeah, mine has the same. Does it? Yeah. And then often there's like a little title that might be kind of helpful. Now, I just want to point out, and we've done this before in previous podcasts, these were not part of the original scripture. Verses. The, the, the verses and the, t and the titles. Yeah. Verses and chapter numbers and, and titles. They've all been added later to be a helpful guide for us. And so that's wonderful. However, it might lead us to think that 
um, I only have to read this, you know, this section. And, um, but that's just, that's just not true. You want right. to look beyond that and look for the main idea, look beyond verses, numbers, section breaks, breaks, and look for the main idea. And so you're saying that 17 and 18 should actually be together. There's a connection here and okay. you're going to see it. I'm going to read it. So verse 17 says, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Verse 18. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. So you see this connection between uh, verse 17 and 18, between suffering and glory. Yeah. So there's a relationship between suffering and, and glory. Um, and the right to be called an heir of God is comes at a price. And <laughs> children of God must share in Christ's suffering. Uh, to share in his glory. And that's that's what we're seeing here. And it, and it kind of makes me start to wonder if, if when our verse says that all things will work together for good, does that all things, does that um, include, you know, the, the suffering that we're seeing here? Because if it does, that definitely means that not all things are good. Okay, I love this. So I, you know, with this book that I, I've read on this misreading scripture with uh, individualistic mm -hmm. eyes, it, it actually mentions this idea of this Eastern culture of this familial piece of this we, right? But they'd make decisions as a group. Um, yeah. They would they would feel honor if somebody in their family was, you know, given an award or given a master's in their degree program or whatever. The whole community would feel the honor of that. They'd also feel the shame of anything if something bad happened to somebody. They would they would be it would be internalized as a we, not an individual problem. And so when we hear this idea of this sharing sharing in glory, and if we're part of God's family and we're gonna share in his glory, we're also gonna share in his suffering, this would be totally normal language mm. for this Eastern culture to have heard because this was, of course, of course, if we're part of God's family, we're going to share in all of it. Like that is normal. But for us in America, it sounds foreign. It's not, yeah, right. it's, it's not how we think of it. It's like, no, that's your problem. <laughs> you, you, you get to have your own suffering and I'm going to have my own problems over here that I get to deal with by myself. Yeah. No, it's so, collectiveness. So you're saying they wouldn't be shocked to hear that. You, yeah. You're going to, if you're part of God's family, Christ's family, you're going to share in a suffering. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have been surprised to hear that where we're like, <gasps> I know we're taken <laughs> aback by it. How dare. <laughs> yeah. No, this is completely a, a normal thing that they would have mm. been the original audience would have been like okay yeah that makes sense all right so in case we have a few you know skeptics out there and, and actually just good practice anyways let's go ahead and, and, and expand to bible context we've been looking at immediate context mm -hmm. just the you know the text surrounding the passage but if we were to expand out a little bit and ask the question do we see this relationship between suffering and glory anywhere else uh, one of my cross references pointed me to first peter 4 12 through 13 where it says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So again, we see this relationship between this present suffering and this future glory um, that will be revealed. So suffering is going against what we are, our assumption we already talked about is what you're saying. Yeah, um, all things are uh, that we're supposed to be for good if you love God. Um, so is there any other passages you came across that help us understand this idea of being a Christian and suffering for God? That's, that's a fair question. And yes, there's a lot of cross references that okay. talk about really this expectation as a follower of Christ that we, sh you know, we're going to experience suffering. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ones that stood out to me was John 15, 20. And it says, remember, this is Jesus speaking. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And so we know that Jesus's life wasn't, you know, wasn't easy. Yeah. Um, he faced suffering and he faced persecution and crucifixion. And, and there's just, there's plenty of cross references here if you want to look into that further. Um, but, but really we're starting to see this answer to this second question is what, what are all things? Yeah. And is everything supposed to be good? I mean, clearly not. There are, there is suffering in, in this life and, and we should, um, expect that. Yeah not be blindsided by that. I, th I think that that's okay for, I mean, Jesus warns us about this all over. Like we not yeah. only see Jesus warn us about this, we see this throughout the New Testament, this warning of that, that it's not going to be easy. Yeah. And so it shouldn't surprise us. Thank goodness. Thank, thank you, Jesus, for giving us this warning that this is something right? that we should expect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Otherwise we would be a little caught off guard. A little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, okay. So 
this actually does lead to some good news. Yay. Yeah. Yay. I yeah. like good news. <laughs> After all of the suffering talk, please tell me yeah. we have good news. <laughs> um, which, you know, in our third question, well, what is the good that we're talking about? If all things lead to good, what what is this good we're talking about? Whose definition of good? Let's mm-hmm. let's dive into that a little a little bit here. Um and so far, we've, we've seen this idea that we're going to be part of God's family and mm-hmm. we're going to be heirs, right? Receiving heir, uh, yeah, yeah. heirs is, uh, we'll be an heir, we'll be a part, uh, part of, we're going to go to God's children. Um, so one of the things that um, I saw in a commentary as I was, um, you know, kind of reading around here, and one of the things we look for under research in the CARA study guide is, is what other resources are there that, that can help you add some clarity to, to what you're reading Bible here? Bible scholars that can help uh-huh. come alongside yeah. of you as like a scholar in a pocket. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you like that? That's how I think of them. They're just like a buddy that helps me along the way there if, we go. I, if I need help and clarity. Which a lot of times you can find in a, study, in a good study Bible. With yeah, study the Bible notes. notes. Uh-huh. The notes, yeah. And um, this one I found in a, the IVP Bible background commentary by Craig Keener. Mm-hmm. And it says, Roman adoption, which could take place at any age, canceled all previous debts and relationship, defining the new son wholly in terms of the new relationship to his father, whose heir he thus became. Oh, I love this because this idea of canceling this debt, you know, if we've been reading prior to, to chapter eight, which, you know, shout out to uh, our Romans five podcast, uh, we ended up doing yeah. a whole thing about enemies of God. We see that Paul is developing this argument yeah. that we are sinners and that we are, we're enemies of God. And this debt, mm-hmm. uh, this debt that this, I, this IVP, background Bible commentary is speaking to is this idea of, um, uh, our sin is, is debt and it's going to be canceled if we become a uh, part of God's family. I love this. Isn't that great? I mean, through, through faith in Christ, our, our sin debt is canceled. Instead of becoming an enemy of God or being an enemy of God, we get to be one of God's children, oh, a part so of his much family. Better. Um, it, it, that alone is, is incredible, but there is more good news. Yay. Yes. I like more, new, more good news. Keep it coming. Yes. So I'm going to read here a section, um, that leads right up to our passage, our verse okay. 28. It's, I'm going to read from verses 18 through 27, again, out of the new living translation. And as I do so, Heather, listen for repetition. Okay. That's one of the things that we like to look for an author is often when an author or a speaker is repeating something over and over again, he's trying to emphasize a point. Yep. And I think we're going to see that here. So hang with me here as I read these verses. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day that God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. (laughs) Amen, right? Amen. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. All right, Heather. Oh my goodness. There's did, so much goodness in there. <laughs> did you catch anything? Like, um, a few things. Okay. So number one, I, I, I heard this waiting, this um, mm-hmm. eager, patiently waiting for his glory yeah. to be revealed. Yeah. Um, and then you hear almost this hope uh, confidently for his future glory that we don't have yet where there's a hope that we're waiting for. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, I I don't know if anyone else, the third thing I heard was groaning. Um, with just anyone, it's kind of a strange word to have in here, but I, I, but with that word picture, you start to really understand the Mm -hmm. eagerness and this waiting and this hoping that's coming because it comes with this groan. I just, Oh, it's such a great word picture to help really lead up to our verse and help I, I'm very excited to hear how you're thinking about these being connected because this idea of waiting and mm-hmm. eagerness and anticipation and groaning, I, I mm-hmm. can sense it. 
I I feel mm-hmm. that you my feel right. You feel it, that, that, that there's, there's we're made for something bigger than this. Yeah. And obviously we're not made for this world. And so that you can feel it in the words that are coming out across. Right. Here. And I think the language that Paul uses, then the fact that you can sense it and you can feel mm-hmm. it, it's like it, very very well written. You're right. All those things, the waiting, the hoping, the groaning, all of those things are um, they're connected. Yeah. They are. And I mean, first we saw that creation is groaning as it was subject to futility and it's eagerly awaiting to be set free from bondage to decay. Uh, there's a shout out to history there back in Genesis 3, 17, the ground was cursed as a result of sin. Yeah. So we see creation is groaning and, you know, waiting to be set free. Humanity is groaning and waiting to be set free. Uh, because, but because of our fallen nature, again, going back to Genesis 3, um, those who belong to Christ were eagerly awaiting uh, to experience the full rights of adoption, oh, including good. the redemption of our bodies. Oh, I love that. And, and this one was a little bit of a surprise too. Even the Holy Spirit is groaning as he intercedes for us in our weakness yes. and in our sufferings. So we really see in, in, in those verses, those passage, that passage there, that all of creation is eagerly awaiting. And as verse 18 so beautifully said, what we suffer now is nothing, nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. Mm. And the beautiful thing here is that it, it started to introduce that we're not left to suffer alone. No. You know, it said that, um, that, that God sent his, his Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's job is to make us happy. Yeah. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> That's not what the Holy Spirit's job I is got for. You, I you got totally you. You totally bamboozled me. That's not the Holy Spirit's job. I was going to see if you, you were doing on this podcast. <laughs> if you were listening. <laughs> Like, wait a second. So, but we really could see some some clarity ar- around um, th- what the Holy, like the Holy Spirit's role here. Yes. And in, in, in what good we can see from that. So, in, like, Which is not to make us happy, just to no. clarify. Okay. <laughs> My goodness, Sarah. <laughs> We're going to read verses 26 through 29. We're still in Romans 8, right? All right. Correct. Just making yeah. sure you're not bamboozling and, me a ton more. And, All right. And now we are actually in the middle of what I'm about to read is our verse. Okay. So you're okay. going to hear it. That's in verse verse 28, but I'm going to start in verse 26. And it says, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Mm. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's will. Mm. So it's, it's, it's not our will. Um, in verse 28, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Verse 29, for God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among among many brothers and sisters. I love it. You paused in a section and I think it was worth pausing for. There's this emphasis that's mm-hmm. not on us. It has everything to do with mm-hmm. his will and his purpose. It's, we're um, being conformed to the image of of his son to mm-hmm. be like Jesus and sharing in his sufferings. This is, But this is him. It's all about him. It has yeah. nothing to do with us. It is. Absolutely. Which is so not how you normally read this you know, and, and really, if we just were to have read the verse, right, you know, the couple of verses right before and right after, we really see that this good isn't necessarily my definition of good, mm-hmm. but, but God's will and God's purpose is coming out pretty, pretty loud, pretty loud and, clear and clear there. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's, there's something else that I, I noticed in, in verse 28 that um, I think is so interesting because it says, for those who love God and are called according to his mm-hmm. purpose, right? Um, it uses the word love. For those who love God, it's not those who belong to God, those who are in Christ, those who have Christ's spirit, Mm. um, which is all language that we've read leading up to this. Mm. It says for those who love God. And so when it it makes me think of, you know, when when you love someone, um, what does that, you know, what does that look like? You know, part of loving God is pursuing his will, Mm -hmm. as we've talked about. Part of loving God is loving what he desires. Yes. I mean, part of loving God is trusting him in our sufferings and in all things. Yes. Yeah. So immediately following our our verse here, um, Paul actually asks four rhetorical questions Mm. um, that you can kind of see is leading up. We're going to see this theme of love coming coming out here again as he finishes strong. But first he asks these four rhetorical questions. And it says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who then is the one who condemns? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? We, we can trust here. You know, we can trust that, that 
God's plan, his, his, his sovereignty, his plan and his will, they can't be thwarted. That's Paul's point. Yeah, I love that. And you use the word sovereign. The, so, the word sovereign just means um, he has control over everything. So yeah. we can trust God because he, we know that he is in control of all things. And his will, his his desires, what's going to happen is not going to be stopped. It's not going to be thwarted. So I, I love that you bring that up because yeah. it's, even though that's not necessarily part of our passage, just going beyond helps us kind of put a little bit of a stake in the ground as saying, this is the God who we're following. Mm-hmm. This is who he is. He's not one. He is in control control. He's, he's in all, all things. Uh, that's fantastic. Well, it also news. tells you that the good that we're talking about can't be taken away. Oh, good. Like That's good. Because it's it's all about God's sovereignty yeah. and he's in control. It, it can't be taken away. That's mm-hmm. that's the kind of good I want, right? Mm-hmm. But this theme of love, and I love how he just, you know, the last thing he said there was, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? If I keep reading Romans 8, 35 through 39, I want to finish here um, before we go to apply because it's just powerful and absolutely stunning. Okay. It, uh, it says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing at all in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ooh, that is powerful. I'm glad you read that. Right? Mm-hmm. And I, I love that that is like the grand, like, like, finale. like the finale yeah. Yeah, that he's been leading up to. But I mean, really, it, it, there's a lot that we've learned about what is this good, mm-hmm. you know, in this definition of, you know, who, who gets to define good. There's a lot that we've learned so far. So let's recap a few of them. Yeah, please. Um, one of them is that God restores um, all things. And in that, there's a future glory. And that, that reward far outweighs our present suffering. No, this is good because there's an um, author named Randy Elkhorn who talks about the dot and the line. He talks about our time here on earth is a dot and that eternity is the line. And are we living for the dot or are we living for the line? And and if I'm hearing what we're talking about here, this is what this definition of good is, is that we often put the a definition of good within the dot. And yeah. what, what we're really seeing is that the actual good is coming in the line, in the eternity, yeah. in that perspective. And if we have that eternal perspective, gosh, I'm okay with God being the one that defines good. Um, because right. if he is sovereign, he knows everything. Uh, and he's the one that's thinking about this eternal perspective, one I cannot see, one that yeah. I do not know. Why on earth am I trying to define good? <laughs> right. right? Like like in my earthly, small, little, tiny dot moment. Let's, right. let's look for the line. No, I, I love I love that. I th- I don't know about you, but I find that I can struggle with this sometimes. I I get so caught up in the present, Mm -hmm. the present worries, the present distractions that I I can forget that there is this eternal focus that we're living for. Um, And and reading my Bible certainly helps me gain that. Mm -hmm. Um, Otherwise, I can lose it pretty easy. Yeah, you know. Uh, Yeah, I can too. Um, But I love that analogy, the dot and the line. That's really helpful, Heather. Mm -hmm. Um, another thing we can learn about this, this good that we've seen is, is when we love God, that our desires and our, our will start to become his desires and his will. I mean, hopefully, right. That, that's the, that's the goal here is we conform to the image shouted. of the son. Yeah. yeah. Shouted loud and clear yeah. in these verses. Right. Which, which means that our definition of, of good changes to what is God's definition of good. I take that definition right? every day of the week. Right. If, if, if he is sovereign, if he is in control, if he is the God of the universe, then he knows way more than I do. So mm-hmm. why on earth am I going to pretend like I know how to define good? He knows it way better than I do. Uh, let, I'll mm-hmm. take, I'll let him, him define it. That's fine with me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. He, he knows way more than I do. So mm-hmm. I've got to trust him. Trust him. Trust him in that. Yeah. When, when my life may not look so easy, but in the, in the long perspective or the long term, or maybe in the lives around me, mm-hmm. um, God has a plan. Yeah. And, um, but also the, the last thing that I think we can take away about this good here is that his love for us cannot be taken away. It no. cannot be thwarted. Nope. Um, there's nothing we can do to make God love us less. So if we were to take these, um, this concept, you've defined a couple things with your questions. Yeah. Um, one of our research questions is how would we rewrite this or how would we paraphrase it? It's a good practice. Yeah. It's really hard to do, but it's a good it practice is. to try and figure out how would we rephrase a verse like Romans eight twenty eight. 
um, I took a tiny stab at it. And I, it was the idea of like, for those that love God, that follow him, trust him, put him first, we should be confident he will work to make us in right standing with him. He's going to cancel our debts. He's going to free us from bondage, including creation, uh, free the creation from mm-hmm. bondage and bring us into perfection in his presence. We get to be in presence with him. Mm. And so we can have confidence living and then knowing that this life is just a moment. It's just a dot. Mm. And the greater gift is the good that we get to look forward to in the eternity, in that line, um, in, in, in with him. It's the, not just eternity. It's eternity in the presence of him. And that is huge. Yeah. Just, that, just through faith. That's, that's good news. That's great That news. is awesome. Well, thank you for doing that hard exercise of paraphrasing. It's one of the harder things that we ask. We do. Um, that, you know, you may not do every time, but it, at times it can be really helpful to try to put it in your own words. And if anyone is willing to paraphrase and send it to mm-hmm. us, I would love to see what other people yeah. uh, paraphrase because this is, it is a hard practice, but it's one that also helps you internalize yeah. what you've just learned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and as, as we go to finish up and, and we want to apply this verse to our lives, right? That's always kind of, that's our goal. Our goal. Y- you know? Yep. Um, th- there's, there's several questions that we ask in our study guide. Um, but the, the question that I think I'm going to hone in on is about prayer. Mm. Um, and there's, there's, it's a kind of a two part question. Um, uh, Lord, what do you want me to learn? Yeah. Right? That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so when we go to apply this to our lives, I think we need to remember a couple of things. One that we should expect suffering as mm-hmm. Christ followers. We are going to share in his suffering. Yep. Um, otherwise we will be, um, frustrated and um, perhaps even angry with God, turn our backs to God, yeah. you know, where, where, where did you go, God? Mm-hmm. Why did you fail me? So understanding that there should be, there is going to be some suffering, um, but this doesn't mean that God doesn't love you, right? Like right. that nothing can stop God from loving you. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where I love that, the New Living Translation, the language in, in there. Um, uh, and also that, that nothing can thwart God's plans. Yeah. His plans are good. And his plans can't be stopped. Yeah. And it's ha- that having that internal perspective. Yeah. If, if we are willing to trust him, he has a larger view on this world than we do. And yeah. if, if his his plan is going to be good, we just don't understand it. Yeah. And nor do we have the view to understand it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So the second part to that prayer question is, you know, the first one, what do we, what do you want me to learn, Lord? And mm-hmm. the second one is, um, how do I apply this to my life? Yeah. And, um, the prayer that I came up with really was along, along the lines of help me to trust your plan, Lord. Mm-hmm. And, and may my desires become your desires because I know they're not always right. Right. And, and help me to have this eternal focus on your promises. Uh, when I feel overwhelmed, when I feel buried in, in life, or when I feel pain and suffering, help me to return or remember your eternal promises. Yeah. Uh, in your plan for us. Oh, I love that, Sarah. Thank, thank you so much for walking us through what could have been a common verse that maybe we have misused in the past. Yeah. And now I feel like we have a better understanding of what it, reading the Bible on our own terms, uh, on the Bible's terms means, not our own terms. <laughs> Let's not do that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if you are interested in uh, wanting to learn more on how to study the Bible, um, visit our website. We have a lot of in-depth articles and resources that are there just for you to be able to take advantage of. You also can subscribe to the CAR Project. We're doing this all the time. In fact, join us next time as we're going to uncover another verse that will help you unpack Kara in action. And we hope that you join us. Thanks for joining us today. 